So today I am here to talk to you about how our applications manage the secrets that they need. But before I get into the nuts and bolts of what that looks like in practice, I want to back up for a minute and think about the bigger picture. And I love all of the talks that we've already had so far today because they're so much in line with this next bit that I wanted to talk about. So we've all seen in the last decade some big changes to how we create and manage and deploy applications. Um, the advent of some collaborative business practices like DevOps and sort of an explosion of tooling has made it so that we're able to move faster and deliver business value faster than ever before. It's been great for software engineering teams and for tech companies, and we've probably all heard the adage that every company is now really a tech company. When I mentioned an explosion of tooling, we've seen slides like this in other presentations this morning. Um, this is just another version of the same thing. There's a lot of tools out there. Um, they do really help us to go faster. You probably recognize most of the products on this slide. You might even feel like I've missed some. And certainly, there seems like there's new ones coming out every day. Um, with all of these new tools, we find that there are additional risks that we need to mitigate to protect our systems and especially our customers' data. These modern pipelines that we're using allow us to improve our flow and velocity and get new code rapidly built, tested, and deployed, but they're not always built for security. And in that way, the threat models and the vulnerabilities that we need to address expand. So one threat vector that our organization worries about in particular is exposed credentials and secrets like those that are inadvertently shared in GitHub repositories, or that may be exposed by vulnerabilities or overprivileging in DevOps tools. Related to this, uh, we've come up with this concept of a security island. So when you have all of these DevOps tools, each of them have their own security mechanisms for access control and audit and compliance and there's nothing that can tie them all together, we call that a security island. So a security island is a tool or a platform that comes built in with its own security components, but these components are isolated and don't facilitate easily making them interoperable or having a centralized way to manage them. When you're dealing with security islands, you don't have centralized audit. You don't have centralized access control or administration if you need to delegate authority, sometimes it's easy enough to delegate authority to govern a certain subsystem, but to govern a subcomponent of a subsystem can get to be inordinately complicated. The tools have inconsistent maturity levels, so some have some really advanced security features, and some really are just starting out implementing their security features. It's difficult to manage at scale when you've got a multi-cloud environment that's using a variety of tool chains, it's hard to get a clear picture of what's even happening, never mind as you scale up your architecture. And it's difficult to map your landscape as a whole. In addition to these security islands that come with all of these tool chains, you can also have engineering teams that become security islands of their own. So if you make security too hard or too complicated, then teams often choose their own security tools and processes that are outside of official policies. And usually this is just referred to as shadow IT, but it's the same sort of idea. So with all that being said, how do we begin to move past these security islands and get to a place where we have centralized governance of the security systems that we have in our architectures? At CyberArk, we want to enable you to build what we call a continent of trust. A continent of trust allows you to get away from security islands and instead weave the tools that you have together to build a centralized system for management that's connected with your established systems of trust. The truth is that we're not going to get away from having suites of disparate tools, but we can start to improve our experience of managing them by finding tools that let us tie them all together. When you build a continent of trust, 
You benefit from having centralized audit, access control, centralized administration. You have a complete overall view of your security landscape. It's easier to delegate authority to administer subcomponents even within individual tools. And it's more manageable at scale. So far, I've been talking really generally about security and all of these different tools, but CyberArk is an expert in privilege access management. And so sort of from here on, I'd like, I'd like to pivot a little bit and focus in particular on that one specific area of security. If you're talking about application privilege management, a continent of trust should enable you to define your complete infrastructure, including the humans that will be accessing the tools and the machines. You should be able to declare exactly which people or applications can access which resources. You should be able to audit all of the connections that are made. And ideally, you should be able to monitor for unusual behavior so you can catch it when something is happening that's unexpected. That's sort of a high level view of it, but in practice, what does this mean? So if we have a system for centrally managing application privilege management, ideally that system will let us bootstrap the machine identity across our tools. So no matter which tool is using, uh, no matter which tool we're using, we should be able to have an easy way to give that tool an identity. We would like to get our appropriately privi privileged apps authenticated with the resources that they need as easily as possible. We want a centralized way of managing access control. And we want to ideally do it in such a way that it reduces complications for developers so that the need for shadow IT is reduced. So let's talk about some common patterns that we and our customers have seen for managing enterprise application privilege management. The first sort of set of ideas that I'd like to talk about are around machine identity. Sometimes this is referred to as service identity or workload identity. I think the language around it is still evolving. But basically, the idea is similar to human identity. We're all comfortable with the idea of human identity. We have usernames for our accounts, email addresses, driver's licenses, and even uh, biometric data now that we can use to identify ourselves. Machines have similar data that can be used to identify them. And so how do we, how do we leverage that? The first model that I'd like to talk about is something we call an identity factory. So if I am an application that wants to connect to a service and I need an identity that that service recognizes, one way to do that is to automatically uh, deploy the application with a token on it that it can give to the service in order to be granted an identity in that service. This is a pretty simple model. It's one that we've used for a long time, but it does suffer from the secret zero problem in that the token must be supplied to the machine at startup. You can do that with automation tools, but it's still something that you have to deal with. The next model that I'd like to talk about is the service broker model. This model is something that's used pretty widely in Cloud Foundry, and it's gaining an adoption in Kubernetes and OpenShift as well. In the service broker model, you have a service broker that sits between your application and the service that it needs to authenticate to. When the application wants to connect to the service, it first can request an identity via the service broker. The one thing about this model that I've personally found to be less desirable is that it makes it really easy to automate identity or authentication, but it's harder to make it easy to automate authorization. So there's a secondary step to authorize the application to access resources in the service that uh, isn't well handled by the model. In the PKI as a service model, there's a central certificate authority that every time a new application comes up, it automatically injects a certificate 
that includes the identity of the application. So this is something that we're seeing become a lot more common with the advent of tools like Istio and the Spiffy standard that's also being implemented by Spire. Um, it is a model that we use for our Conjure service in Kubernetes. And Cloud Foundry, additionally, is now automatically deploying instance identity certificates to each application instance that's spun up. So as uh, more sophisticated tools adopt this model, it's really going to become easier and easier to have secure service-to-service -service authentication. But not all services are adopting these more sophisticated models yet. We're finding that there are still a lot of services that are using traditional username and password or API key or some kind of access token to govern access to the application. So if this is the case that most services are still de facto using credentials to gauge, gate access to the service, in practice, how can we securely supply applications with the credentials that they need to access a service in a way that won't expose those credentials? The most common workflow that we see in our business is that for this kind of a problem, you store the credentials in a vault, you use one of the more sophisticated methods of bootstrapping machine identity to give the application an identity in the vault, and then the application communicates with the vault to retrieve the credentials that it needs and uses those to connect to the service that it needs to connect to. So in the next section, I'm gonna focus on this even narrower use case of an application using credentials to connect to a service that it needs. And I think I've just now come to the title of my talk. So there's a few different ways that you can do this. On my team at CyberArk, we've been working very hard to find uh, better and easier ways to make this possible, and I'll go into some of the models that we've uh, worked on in the next few slides. So, the first is that you can manually modify your application to communicate directly with the Vault API. So, using a client library or by a uh, sending requests to the API directly, your application can request the credentials that it needs from the Vault API and then use those to open connections to services. The benefit of this method is that it is very flexible, you can use it in most environments, but it also requires a lot of manual intervention by developers. In the time that developers are spending on implementing these very specific Vault APIs and keeping updated with them, it's time that they're not directly adding to business value. So this is something that at CyberArk we've viewed as problematic and we've tried to look for ways to make this a little bit easier. The first model that we have to make this a little bit simpler is a project that we call Summon. It works with many different secret stores. Uh, it's extensible, so if your particular beloved secret store isn't um, supported yet, it's actually very easy to add support for it. And I'd be happy to talk about that at another time. Summon basically implements the Vault API for you so that you just take your application process that you would normally run to start your application and you wrap it with a command to summon. Before your application starts, Summon communicates with your Vault and retrieves the credentials and injects them into your application's environment at runtime. So your application can still work in a 12-factor way, retrieve its credentials from the environment. They're placed there by Summon. And it's honestly pretty easy to use, and I find that I use it often even on my local machine. If I'm doing development and I need to access a certain credential, I can store it 
in my OSX keyring and use the summon to deliver that to my process. One of the things that we learned from seeing customers use summon, however, is that because the application still had access to the credentials, mistakes could happen and credentials could be leaked into logs. So to improve the experience of that, we have a new open source project called Secretless Broker. With Secretless Broker, instead of handing back to the application a bunch of credentials, it hands back an authenticated connection. So to take a second and look at the internal architecture, when an application needs to make a request to a target service like a database or an API, instead of making the request with credentials directly to the target service, it opens a local connection to the secretless broker with no credentials at all. The secretless broker knows what the request is supposed to be directed toward based on the local port or local socket file that the request came in on. It communicates with the credential provider to get the credentials that that connection needs and injects those credentials into the connection request. It navigates the authentication handshake with the target service and seamlessly streams back an authenticated connection to the application. So the benefit of this is that the application never needs to know the credentials at all. The application just opens a local connection without credentials to the secretless broker and is returned an authenticated connection to the service that it needs to get information from. It also, like Summon, works with a bunch of popular secrets providers. And with this method, we think developers will be more able to focus on delivering value because they don't have to even think about where the secrets for their connections are going to come from. They develop connecting their application to a local port or a local socket file. So the last method that I wanted to talk about is uh, the concept of a service mesh. So with a service mesh, it's sort of a, an implementation of that PKI as a service. Usually uh, there's a, well, all, all communication between services and a service mesh happens over mutual TLS so that you're able to communicate securely. The concept has been growing in popularity as I said, it usually leverages PKI as a service for bootstrapping the identity. And I expect to see this model become more common in applications, especially with the recent graduation of Envoy from CNCF. The last category that I wanna discuss, and just briefly, is how to manage access control in a centralized way for your systems. Uh, the main Thing that we like to recommend for that is having some way of writing your security policy as code. So if you have some way of writing your security policy as code, you can define all of the entities in your system, all of the services that need to connect to each other, the human and machine actors that are going to be accessing those services. You can decide who gets to connect to what and revoke access to those services if needed. It enables a holistic view of your systems and gives you a way to monitor your changes to your systems over time. So in sum, when you put this all together, you have this centralized management system that allows your workflows to continue at DevOps speed, but with centralized oversight. So as soon as your app comes up, it can automatically retrieve an identity retrieve the credentials that it needs or the connection that it needs to connect to a target service, open up that connection and be up and running. So I'd like to encourage you to look for ways to get away from having security islands. Ideally, I think we could all have tools that will allow us to centrally manage the security of our systems. There's been a lot of great talks talking about this idea today and hopefully we continue to iterate toward a better future on that front. Thank you.